This is going to be an overview of the book of Leviticus. And the book of Leviticus is a very overlooked book of the Bible. Many people don't read it because they think it's just flat out boring. They think it doesn't, it doesn't have any relevance for today. And they think it's just too hard to follow without just falling asleep. But the book of Leviticus is amazing in that like all the other books of the Bible, it shows us the Lord Jesus Christ. So in this book of Leviticus, you'll see the word holy many times. It occurs 94 times in 77 verses in the book. And it looks like the first 10 or so chapters picture the way that we become holy in the New Testament. Because the first five chapters will show you the burnt offering and the meat offering and the peace offering, the sin offering and the trespass offering. And to get holiness from God in the New Testament, you need to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect offering, the ultimate offering. He voluntarily offered himself. And you read in Hebrews seven twenty six through 27, For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily to, as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. So when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the ultimate sacrifice, we can be saved and have eternal life. The moment you do this, your standing in the sight of God is holy, harmless, and undefiled. That is how the Lord will see you. Notice that each one of those five offerings in the book of Leviticus, in the first five chapters there, will show us the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, you see the burnt offering. In Leviticus 1.9, it says, But his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Now look at the New Testament. Look what it says about Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 5, 2, it says, And walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. So both the burnt offering and the Lord Jesus Christ, the ultimate offering and sacrifice, both of those things are a sweet savor to God. Now Hebrews 9.14, How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So Jesus Christ is without spot, just like the burnt sacrifice in the book of Leviticus. In Leviticus 1.3 it says, If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. So you see both the burnt sacrifice here in Leviticus 1 and the Lord Jesus Christ are without blemish and without spot. Also notice it refers to to this offering here. It says for him to offer it of his own voluntary will. Just like the sinner accepts Jesus Christ of his own voluntary will. Now number two, you have the meat offering. And in the New Testament, John six twenty seven says, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So Jesus Christ is the meat. He is the true meat offering. This also shows us the scriptures because that's our meat, that's our bread. Leviticus 2.1 says, When any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it and put frankincense thereon. And then verse 2, And he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and he shall take there out his handful of the flour thereof and of the oil thereof with all the frankincense thereof and the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar to be an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the lord so the priest takes a handful of flour 
the oil with frankincense and burns it on the altar. This shows us how like a preacher or a teacher today takes handfuls of the word of God pictured by the flower. The Holy Ghost gets in it and he's pictured by the oil and the frankincense pictures praying over it before he preaches it or teaches it. So there you have a great picture. Revelation 8, 4 says, And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints. So, you see that there, that illustration. Then, the burning on the altar pictures how it burns in our heart. In turn, causing it to burn in the heart of the listeners. Now, number three, the peace offering. This shows you Jesus Christ, because in Colossians 1, 20, it says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether there be things in earth or things in heaven. So he is our peace offering. Number four, you have the sin offering. Second Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So in Leviticus chapter four, you had the sin offering, and Jesus is the ultimate offering for sin. Number five, you have the trespass offering. Colossians 2.13 says, And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So, chapter 5 of Leviticus talks about the trespass offering. Jesus Christ is our trespass offering. Then in Leviticus chapter 6 through 7, you have the laws of the offerings. In chapters 8 through 10, you have instructions for the priests. Aaron, the high priest, pictures Jesus Christ, while Aaron's sons pictures born-again Christians. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So Aaron pictures the Lord Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ is an high priest, that's without sin. And if you are saved, you are called a priest yourself. And the book of Revelation chapter 1, 5 through 6, it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So you're a priest if you're saved. And the high priest is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in chapters 11 through 14, you have laws of purity. In chapter 11, it goes into what the Lord wants the children of Israel to eat or not to eat. Leviticus 11, 3 says, Whosoever parteth the hoof and is cloven-footed and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall ye eat. And you know, the whole chapter goes through talking about uh, animals that part the hoof and chew the cud. But this pictures how, as a Christian, you need to talk the talk and walk the walk. You need to part the hoof and chew the cud, not just chew the cud and not part the hoof. But James one twenty two says, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Don't just read the Bible and then, talk about the Bible, and not live what the Bible says. But as a born-again Christian today, you aren't commanded to abstain from certain meats, as it talks about in Leviticus 11, because in Colossians 2, 16 through 17, it says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So, in chapter 12, it goes into purification after childbirth. And this reminds me of how once you are born into the family of God, you need to work on cleaning your life up after your second birth. So the rest of Leviticus seems to picture our state while still in this sinful flesh. And the first part of the book showed us how we get our standing holy. While the rest seems to show how to keep our state as holy as we can keep it. And that is through pictures. It's showing, the, showing us all this stuff through pictures. 
things in the Old Testament picture things in the New Testament. So in chapter 13, it goes into cleansing laws. For example, in chapter 13, you have laws about leprosy. In Leviticus 13, 2, it says, When a man shall have in the skin of his flesh a rising, a scab, or bright spot, and it be in the skin of his flesh like the plague of leprosy, then he, he shall be brought into Aaron the priest, or unto one of his sons the priest. And this shows us how other people can make us dirty. As a born-again believer, you need to separate from the world. 2 Corinthians 6.17 says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Then in 1 Corinthians 15.33, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Ephesians 5.11, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So, other people can make you dirty. And that's illustrated in the book of Leviticus. And of course now it's... I mean it's still true. Other people can make you dirty in a physical sense. But it's emphasized in the spiritual sense. In the New Testament other people can rub off on you and make you unclean. In chapter 14 you have laws about cleansing lepers in their houses. And this reminds me that you need to clean house after you get saved. The Bible says, you know, what have they seen in thine house? And you need to clean the beer out of the fridge. Clean the DVD cabinet. Get rid of the filthy movies. Get rid of the things that are going to cause sin to spread in your life and family. Just like they didn't want that leprosy to spread. And in chapter 15, it goes into laws about bodily discharges. In Leviticus 15, 3 through 5, it says, And this shall be his uncleanness and his issue, whether his flesh run with his issue, or his flesh be stopped from his issue. It is his uncleanness. Every bed whereon he lieth that hath the issue is unclean, and everything whereon he sitteth shall be unclean. And whosoever toucheth his bed shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. And then Leviticus fifteen thirteen, when he that hath an issue is cleansed of his issue, then he shall number to himself seven days for his cleansing, and wash his clothes, and bathe his flesh in running water, and shall be clean. So as a New Testament Christian, these verses remind you how people can rub off on you and make you dirty. Just like the leprosy could rub off on someone, make them dirty. And then you see how it's told to, to wash in running water. Did you know it's not? it wasn't up until pretty recently, I guess, I don't know how long, maybe like in the past hundred years or so, that people started washing their hands in running water. And the Bible talked about this a long time ago. But in chapter 16, you have the day of the... A day of atonement and you can see the scapegoat and chapter 17 through 20 you have laws of holiness leviticus 17 7 says and they shall see no more and they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils after whom they have gone a whoring this shall be a statute forever unto them throughout their generation so after you get saved you need to quit sacrificing all your time to devils Redeem the time because the days are evil. Get busy for the Lord. Read your Bible. Pray. Get some type of ministry or help someone else's. Chapter 18 goes into unlawful sexual relations, which Paul also mentions in his epistles. He mentions sodomites and lesbians. In Romans chapter 1, he mentions abusers of themselves with mankind in 1 Corinthians 6 which is the sodomites. And it's just like it mentions it here in Leviticus 18. Nothing's changed. Leviticus 18, 20 through 23 says, Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. 
Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. So as a Christian, you need to quit fornicating. As Paul mentions over and over. He says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. In chapter 19, it goes further into holy living, which is still applicable for New Testament Christians. Leviticus 19, 2 through 4 says, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy. For I, the Lord your God, am holy. Ye shall fear every man his mother, and his father, and keep my Sabbaths, I am the Lord your God. Turn ye not unto idols, nor make to yourselves molten gods, I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 19.11-13 through 13, Ye shall not steal, neither deal, deal falsely, neither lie one to another. And ye shall not swear by my name falsely. Neither shalt thou profane the name of the Lord thy God, I am the Lord. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. Leviticus 19.16-18 Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. And how true is that for today? You have a lot of people going up and down as a talebearer, you know, spreading junk spreading gossip their lies neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor i am the lord thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself i am the lord see how relevant this stuff is for today and all these standards for holy living are true today <clears throat> and you can't throw out the old testament and chapter 20 shows us that there are consequences <coughs> there are consequences for turning away from the lord which is also true for a new testament saint in Leviticus 20 and verse 6, it says, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits, and after wizards, to go a-whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul, and will cut him off from among his people. So there you see consequences. Just like in the New Testament, Hebrews 12 and verse 8, But if you be without chastisement whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. If you do bad things in the flesh and you're a child of God, you're going to face chastisement. Leviticus 21 talks about holiness for the priest. And this pictures how the Lord, our high priest, is without sin and without blemish. So when we believe on him, we are without sin and without blemish. Leviticus 21, 7 says, They shall not take a wife that is a whore or profane, neither shall they take a woman put away from her husband, for he is holy unto his God. So a Christian shouldn't disobey what Paul said and yoke himself with unbelievers or, or an unbelieving wife. Leviticus 21, 18 through 21 says, For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man or a lame or he that hath a flat nose. And it goes on to talk about a man that's broken-footed, broken-handed, crook-backed, a dwarf, hath blemishes in his eye, you know, all these other things. And a lot of people get mad about this because uh, they say, well, God's being, you know, prejudiced against these kind of people. But this is just a picture of how Aaron... Uh, the high priest needs to be without blemish just like our high priest is without blemish a born again believer if you're a born again believer then your high priest is without blemish and then the moment you believe the gospel when it comes to your standing in Christ since you're like Christ 
you are without blemish. And that's just all that illustrates there. And then in Leviticus 22, it goes and talks about acceptable offerings. In chapter 23, it talks about the feasts. And these feasts are the Passover, which is in the first month. And then you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because Jesus is without leaven. He's, he's got no sin. And, you know, with, with the Passover, in 1 Corinthians 5, 7... Jesus is actually called our Passover. And then you have the first fruits. It's, this is also in the first month. And and 1 Corinthians 15, 20 even calls Christ our first fruits. And then you have the Feast of Weeks, which is in the second month. Then you have Pentecost in the third month. And the Holy Ghost made the church a living organism on, at Pentecost in the book of Acts. And then in the 4th, 5th, and 6th month, you have no feast. And then you have the Feast of Trumpets, which pictures, you know, the rapture. And then you have the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 16.22, it, going back to it, it talks about the scapegoat that's, that takes place on the Day of Atonement. And it says, And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities into a land not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. And that pictures the Lord Jesus Christ, as it says in Second Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And then you have the Feast of Tabernacles in the seventh month. So you see all these feasts, and all these feasts will show you something about the Lord Jesus Christ. Then in chapter 24, it talks about oil for the light, the showbread. The lamps are to burn continually. In Leviticus 24, 2, it says, Command the children of Israel that they bring into the pure oil, olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually. This should remind you in your Christian life, if you are a preacher or a teacher, don't let the fire burn out. Keep reading. Keep learning. And then pass it on to an another Christian. Too many have lost interest in the book. Their sermons are shallow. Their main focus is on music. They'll sing a hundred songs to get people to come to, to the altar through music. And then the preaching is just very vague and watered down. And their congregations lack so much knowledge of the word because they are failing to preach the word. They're letting the lamp burn out. You don't want to let the lamp burn out. In part of chapter 24 to 25, you have the civil laws. In Leviticus 25, you also see the year of Jubilee. For the Jew, this pictures the day of the Lord. For us, it pictures the day of Christ when we're set free at the rapture. Because the year of Jubilee is in the 50th year and people will be made free of their debts. They're, the slaves go free. Slaves return home to their families. And stuff like that just pictures, you know, when we're just free from the, from the flesh at the rapture. Leviticus 26 talks about blessings for obedience and punishment for disobedience. Leviticus 26, 1 through 4 says, You shall make you no idols nor graven image, neither rear you up a standing image, Neither shall you set up any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it. For I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield her fruit. And, you know, Paul shows us this same law of sowing and reaping in the New Testament. In Galatians 6, 7 through 8, he says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. But this has been an overview of the book of Leviticus. And I just hope that it, it's shown you that there's so much in this book and that you should just get into it and read it and 
realize that it's the most interesting book in the world, the Bible, that is. It's the most interesting book. You can go to any book of the Bible and just learn, you know, learn things for your everyday life. You know, you, there's things in every book that you could take as practical application for yourself today, even though all of it doctrinally wouldn't apply to you. And, you know, you can find Jesus Christ on every page. But this has been the book of Leviticus.